Hello and welcome to the Work for Change podcast. It's your girl, Sam. Hey, we got a new co-host going on over I'm here. I'm taking over. Apparently, I've been <laughs> replaced. <laughs> Get out. Do you want me to leave? We need privacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not the kind of podcast we run here. <laughs> Things are changing. That's, uh, that's our OnlyFans account we're going to be <laughs> releasing. No. <laughs> no. No one wants to see that. No well, one wants well, to see that. Well. Welcome to the Work for Change podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. This is episode 76 of the Work for Change podcast, we have, oh my gosh, an amazing so, episode. It so, was so much fun. Guess what? 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 We're excited for this episode. <laughs> yeah, we haven't said I've, that every have, time someone <laughs> a guest comes on. But it's true. This That's, one's really good. This, this one was super interesting. And it was kind of a porty. A, 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 a party. <laughs> almost like a porty. You know, like, like it's a porty. It's yeah. a porty. It's there a was party. Five, five people on this, this episode. Yeah. Most, I think this is the most people we've it, ever well, had. Well, you did you do the round table up in oh, he, or something like no, that? No, I don't think so. I think right. this is the most. If so we, if we're wrong, comment that we're wrong. It's who cares? Fine. We're the this is the most. So what what do we yeah. what do we what do we do today, Sam? Who are we talking so to? So we had Casey and Josh from Levels Health with us, and that is a CGM kind of program. What's Full a CGM? CGM? Sorry, a CGM is a continued glucose monitor. What does that mean? It measures your blood sugar with data. So it's not just like a finger prick where you check your blood sugar one time. It's going to show you data of what is happening in your body. So the main, the main reason we wanted to have them on was because we wanted to fix John's hanger problem. That's the main <laughs> reason. <laughs> Which, we wanted stay tuned no, and hear about. <laughs> Basically, they said um, the ultimate... Contributors are Taco Bell and Chipotle. <laughs> not kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I didn't say that. I'm not gonna put words in their mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're like, yeah, that. we heard your intro, no, and you, we're you suing lied. you. <laughs> you're, you're we're literally suing you. lied from the very beginning. Dang it. No, but this yeah. this episode was. I, mean, I learned so much. Like mm-hmm. I learned a lot during this, and with CGMs and and uh, like why they can be important, why mm-hmm. they can be helpful. Because right now, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam, mm-hmm. but most of the time, people that have CGMs are people that are diabetic, right? That yeah. have to monitor their their blood glucose and all that stuff because if they don't, they literally could die. Is yeah. my, am I correct? And so, but this company, and I'm sure there's other ones that are like it, but what they're trying to do is get it, get these CGMs in the hands of people that aren't dealing with that mm-hmm. so they can still optimize their health. They can optimize, not just like their health, but optimize their daily life on how you feel. Mm-hmm. Like um, one thing that we talked a lot about, but I, I just, so if you're kind of, struggling to grasp what we're talking about, right? So if you're someone that maybe you eat a meal and you just feel unbelievably tired afterwards, right? The, there's the word, the itis. You, you eat something and then you're just like, I can't move right now. I'm so full or like, I just feel so tired. You might be having issues that you don't even know of. Yeah. And so if you're using one of these, you can find out, oh my gosh, I ate, this is what I ate and this is what happened with my blood sugar. This is what was going on. So it was just a really interesting conversation that I'm, I'm, I'm seriously excited for you guys to listen to. Yeah. yeah. Knowledge is power and they just well, they they were just saying how that you can use this data to like basically change your life like yeah. you know yeah um, you heard it here for here for you heard it here <laughs> first folks this episode will change your life <laughs> if you can <laughs> speak the sentence first um, no but we really honestly we hope you guys enjoy this episode um, if you guys do be sure to let us know in our comment section on YouTube um, or on our comments on Instagram at work for change podcast say hi to me say hi comments. to Sam <laughs> um, follow all of us individually you know just let us know you liked it That'd and on the cool. podcast Instagram and the podcast Instagram at work for change podcast I said that oh, okay yeah. so sure. um, with before we uh, mess this intro up anymore I hope you guys enjoy this episode episode <laughs> 76 of the Work for Change podcast. Um, Josh and Casey, <laughs> thank you guys so much for being a part of the Work for Change podcast today. Thanks so much for having us on. Thank you. We're happy to be here. So um, we talked a little bit about the intro, but um, it's kind of a cool way that we got connected was um, I was talking to Dr. Nick um, on our episode with the fittest doc. And I was talking about the curiosity of blood sugar and insulin and how it infects someone who is non-diabetic, just like how I've noticed my mood has changed or whatever. 
Um, <laughs> Jean, and yeah. being hangry, hangry. Is the, being hangry is the, I'm trying to solve <laughs> hanger. Um, we need it solved. We need so it. We. As yeah. a family, as a family, yeah. we need to understand why he is the way that he is. But we'll get there. Um, but that's really our company's mission is to solve hanger. <laughs> is that the new? Is that the new slogan for, for solving, 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 worldwide. solving worldwide hanger? <laughs> um, but so we were talking about him and he brought you guys up and then uh, you guys, like you said, you had a, a mutual person kind of say, hey, I want to sign up because I heard about it on the Work for Change podcast. And then that's how we kind of got connected. So would you guys kind of let our listeners know, like, what is Levels and, and the, the mission and vision behind what you guys are doing? Yeah. So if uh, we can split this one up, how about I explain what it is and Casey, you give the, the mission and, and vision statement. Yeah. and. Uh, yeah, so um, you can think of the Levels program as uh, connecting people to their own biological info in real time. So uh, we call these things bio wearables, which are wearable devices that give uh, deeper metrics than your standard Fitbit and Apple Watch, which uh, those measure superficial things like heart rate, heart rate variability. This gives you actually meta metabolic information. It's measuring molecules that are in your bloodstream. And so uh, the prime example is the continuous glucose monitor. So we use this technology, continuous glucose monitors, combined with the levels analytics and insights software to close the loop between the decisions every, every person has to make every day and the responses, so the actions and reactions that your body experiences as a result of those decisions. Um, so our, our focus there is to generate metabolic awareness to help people understand these are the things that I'm, uh, I'm doing each day that are affecting my goals positively or negatively. Um, and the, the rationale for your goals can be many. It can be a performance decision. It can be trying to, to lose a few pounds or it can be long term uh, sort of chronic illness that you're, you're focused on on sort of, you know, guiding the ship in a direction that doesn't end up there. And so uh, that's what the, the sort of primary high level uh, description would be. And uh, we can get into more detail. But the reason we're doing this, I'll hand over to Casey. Yeah. So like Josh said, like our primary focus is really to expand what we like to call metabolic awareness on this massive scale. Um, traditionally, really the focus for the idea of thinking about glucose or metabolism has really largely been focused on the conversation of type one and type two diabetes. People who have, you know, diagnosed conditions of glucose dysregulation and, you know, our, our sort of guiding philosophy is that it actually is really important to start much, much earlier thinking about um, glucose and glycemic dysregulation and how our dietary and lifestyle factors are affecting our glucose responses. These are not diseases that come on overnight. You know, it's not like a type two diabetes. It's an on off switch where one day you're not diabetic and next year you're, you are. It's really a spectrum that probably starts years, if not decades before people meet the clinical threshold uh, uh, for, for these diseases. And what we know from the research is that Along that spectrum from totally normal, you know, really healthy, perfect metabolism all the way to sort of full-blown disease states, there's actually a lot of clinical impact of glycemic dysregulation far before um, we reach that, that full-blown diagnosis. So, so, those are, so, so for the person out there who, you know, has no idea where they are along that spectrum, um, having access to continuous glucose monitoring data and being able to really close the loop between what they're eating, how they're sleeping, how they're stressing, um, how they're moving and their exercise and how that's affecting uh, their place on this metabolic spectrum we think is really, really valuable. Um, and I think, I think when you just look, look at the statistics of where we're at as a country in terms of some of these metabolic diseases from type two diabetes, overweight, prediabetes, obesity, um, you know, we're, we're obviously, I don't need to tell you guys, we're, we're really not doing well. Um, you know, 70% of Americans are overweight or obese, 30 million, million Americans have type two diabetes and 88%, 88 million more are pre-diabetic. And of those who are pre-diabetic, which again, is kind of moving up the spectrum of glycemic dysregulation, 90% of those people with pre-diabetes don't know it. So we are just passionate about awareness and about access to personal data and about biofeedback to close the loop uh, between all these activities we're doing every day, food choices, lifestyle choices, and how they're affecting us. Wow, that's super awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, what through, I, so you guys are in the, um, you guys talked about being in your early stages, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What are some like discoveries you have found so far 
through people like wearing them and through the the levels you know like what are some of the i maybe not eye opening but just some of the common trends you've been seeing uh so some of the most interesting uh, facts that, that we're starting to realize are, are have always been there and that this data is just sort of filling in the picture of is that uh, the concept of normal, uh, you know, what blood sugar looks like for someone who is is not uh, diagnosed with a, a metabolic dysfunction, the concept of normal is, is completely unknown. So you have people who um, experience nighttime lows down to 40, 50 milligrams per deciliter regularly. You have people who experience experience sustained elevations from exercise that are well beyond the uh, thresholds that, uh, you know, large organizations like the American Diabetes Association would identify as abnormal. And, and so there are all these like corner cases that everyone experiences in their daily lives that uh, would define them as abnormal, but are very likely to just be core components of the human metabolism. And then there is the, the induced abnormality that we see where people are eating things every single day. And this is where I think I would draw a line into like, these are the, the negative inductions that you're bringing into your own life. So you're eating things every single day that you have no idea are producing this really huge uh, maladaption. So you're, you're like pushing yourself over and over and over in the direction of dysfunction. And the worst part is these can oftentimes be decisions you're actively making because you think they're healthier. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to give an example from my own data. So one of the, um, one of the most interesting ones, I, I went to a juice cart in New York city and it was an organic pressed juice cart. And I ordered what was called health drink and it was a pressed <laughs> apple. It was a pressed, pressed celery root and pressed carrot and uh, no added sugar, no added anything. And uh, so they just, you know, press the juices out. There's no fiber. And I know that I am a carbohydrate hyper reactor or a hyper responder. So um, I, my blood sugar just increases very rapidly and to a, a very large extent. So I'm, I may be, you know, I'm somewhere along the metabolic spectrum case he was describing, but I got this drink, I drank it and my blood sugar was well over 200 for an hour. And wow. that, you know, is something that, uh, shocks many people because, uh, you know, oftentimes people are going to these carts. They're saying, you know what, I'm not going to go to Dunkin' Donuts today. I'm instead going to get this gross juice. That I don't even want to drink because it's healthier <laughs> for me. And in fact, it might be doing the same or worse, you know, to their blood sugar as that donut might have. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not equating fruit juice and or, uh, vegetable juice and donuts. I'm simply saying that, uh, the glycemic exposure in both those cases is not a, a good situation and it can be modified, you know, by eating whole fruits or whole vegetables and getting the same quality and nutrition uh, without seeing that sort of exposure to the high glucose levels. So those are just some examples of like some of the things that you would have no idea about if you didn't have the data stream. Yeah. Yeah. And I would uh, add, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, I would add two more things that we've seen from early users that are like, that are so exciting to me. Um, one is just this concept of sort of personalizing your own diet through this metabolic lens, like Josh is speaking to, but we've had some in, some users who have been following sort of more um, diet philosophies like ketogenic diets or vegan diets who have actually been able to really refine these diets to make them actually work for them better. And so, for instance, with the, the ketogenic um, individuals that I'm thinking about, you know, in order to maintain a ketogenic state, you need to be fat oxidizing and fat oxidation by necessity requires low insulin levels and low insulin level insulin is going to be triggered by, you know, how, how quickly and how much carbohydrates get into your bloodstream, but that varies person to person. And yeah. we know that a, a single carbohydrate, um, or a single, uh, food is going to affect glucose levels in two different people, potentially completely differently based on all sorts of factors, like their microbiome and their genetics and their body type and all these things. So, Without having tools to really gain insight into how foods are affecting your glucose levels and kind of by proxy or insulin levels, you might be, you know, just following a super, super, super strict version of keto in an effort to get into this like low insulin foundation state. Found with some of our keto users, they discover foods that are kind of a little bit carbier that actually mm -hmm. really minimally elevate their glucose. And so they're able to actually liberalize their keto diets and, and still maintain ketogenesis. And so that to me is really exciting because it, it's using information to sort of like liberalize choices. And I think similar is true with vegan diets. Um, there've been some users we've had who 
um, have been following a vegan diet, but not really meeting their health goals, like weight loss or things like that. And when you put the levels product on and start tracking this stuff minute to minute, what you start seeing is that actually some of these choices, whether it's the food combinations, the carb choices, the time of day eating, et cetera, they're actually getting really high glucose spikes, which could, you know, be spiking insulin and then impairing sort of weight loss efforts and things like that, or mood, energy, et cetera. And so you can really tailor the choices within a specific diet to meet whatever the goals are. And we've been kind of seeing that over and over again, which is exciting to me because you get this biofeedback, it's personalized diet. And I think um, people are hungry for like information about nutritional information about how to be healthiest and whatnot. But um, there's not a one size fits all diet and having objective data is like, a, I think a total, a total game changer for people in terms of empowerment and also adherence to, to diets. So totally. Yeah. yeah I think that when it comes to something I've always said in a lot of my videos is that knowledge is power. And like when it comes to like, for me, I, I, I focus with a lot of people that are trying to lose weight. So a lot of people genuinely don't know calories they don't know anything right so and like people have that knowledge they have more power to make the right decisions with their diet right and then that's like the very basic and this is almost a step up because like something so something that uh, Josh was saying that like resonated with me was like making choices that you think are healthier um, mm -hmm. but it but are actually kind of maybe I don't want to say like hurting you but they're they're not having the, the right effect that you would assume and so like something for me I used to eat oatmeal every single day, every morning, and I would eat a lot of it, like three servings, and I ate, I would eat a lot of it. But I would notice every single time after I would eat that meal, I would be so tired to the point where mm -hmm. it's like I felt like I had to take a nap. And so in the past, I don't know how many months, a few months, right? I've like cut out oatmeal and I feel a lot better. And so it's just it would be I, I can almost guarantee if I had that that monitor on me, I would be able to see like, oh, I'm crashing after I, you know, I have this huge spike, I'm crashing and I feel like I need to take a nap. And so like, I think that it was when you were explaining that, I was like, that's exactly what I was going through. And then, I mean, there's so many things that I want to say, but then another thing that you were talking about, like, like with the pre-diabetes and all that stuff, like every being on a spectrum is so, it's so true. And like, I, I remember I went into the doctors when I was in 10th grade. <laughs> I didn't go in willingly. My mom tricked me into going <laughs> into the doctors. Um, but th I ended up going in there and they basically said like, you're pre pre-diabetic. So it's like, you're not technically, ha you haven't hit the numbers yet, but like you will be there. And mm -hmm. I was at a point where I was like, Oh, well that's fine. I'm not even pre-diabetic. Like I'm killing it. <laughs> but like the, f the fact that like, someone using this could have that information and they would 100% know, like, the choices I'm making right now, this is the path that I'm going to go down. It's not because the, the mean doctor is saying this to me. It's not because whatever video I watched is freaking me out. It's like, I can see the data on my own. And yes. I think an another thing that is super cool is that it's so personalized. And that's one of the things that I talk about with diets is, like, I don't like to share what I'm eating all the time because I'm like, it doesn't, like, what I'm eating doesn't matter to you. Like, it's just, my diet doesn't. It, it doesn't impact what you're eating at all, it sh or at, le at least it shouldn't, you know? And so I think that the fact that this can help someone have a more personalized diet, and then obviously it's not just personalized, but then it's optimized as well for them. I think that it's, it's really, really cool. I'll stop talking now, but I just <laughs> wanted to say all that. <laughs> no, well, I, I love it. The, the oatmeal example in particular is, is, it really comes across for many people because if you Google healthiest breakfast, like you just go ahead and Google that, oatmeal comes up in the top, top three, top five results every single time. It's, it's the, it's the healthy breakfast. And I, I don't, I, you know, as Casey just stated, as you just stated, there's so much individuality here. And so it's not the case that oatmeal is not, not healthy, but mm. I have tested oatmeal numerous times and my blood sugar invariably goes over 180. I can't eat oatmeal without, and this is completely plain. It's not even like it's not putting maple sugar, sugar on there or anything. This is plain oats. And so it, this is like exactly the same anecdote you were just saying, how you feel, you feel that tiredness. Anytime my blood sugar reaches a certain elevation, it's going to come crashing down because thankfully my, my pancreas is still working. Uh, you know, so I, I still have endogenous insulin, but that crash is what destroys my, my days, uh, you know, energy levels. And so, you know, it's the case that like this, this metabolic spectrum, it's possible, you know, this is what type two diabetes is. You eventually overcome through, you develop hyperinsulinemia, you eventually overcome your pancreas ability to, to, uh, respond to the glucose levels that you're inducing. And then things start to really break down. And, you know, we, that's not strictly what we think everyone has to worry about. Like you don't have to live your life in total fear of type two diabetes, but <laughs> these micro optimizations to live a better lifestyle can, 
can it function in the same way, right? It's like, it's accomplishing the same goal. Um, so I have type one diabetes and I wear a CGM and I was only diagnosed about two years ago. So I was diagnosed as an adult. Um, wow. But kind of the fun thing, I guess, about it <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, is I will test different foods and see how they react because I mm. do have a CGM and I can correct with insulin. So I have that luxury of being able to look at the data I get. Um, and just from experience, oatmeal works great for me. Uh-huh. No, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. that's so funny. Um, but I also put a serving of peanut butter. So I know that delays the spike hey. with the fats. Um, so- that's yeah. fascinating. So that that's fascinating, like because that that little insight that you have there about peanut butter is mm-hmm. something that like zero people just uh, yeah. arrive at. They think it's like, oh, I either can eat this food or I can't. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting, exactly like you're saying. Uh, once people get the data, and we we can like sort of you know encourage them to tr- try some experimentations, like try mixing up the macronutrient quantity or uh, yeah, like the, the macronutrient ratios, because you know fats have an impact. And most people are like, what? That makes no sense. Like there's still the same number of carbs in the meal, but it's the, it's the like physiologic effect of having fat, you know, it, like I'm not going to get in case he can fill in all the details there, but like <laughs> yeah. the digestion has changed and there's all these different impacts that simply adding a little bit of peanut butter, or almond butter can, can do. And people love that. Like being able to see the difference between plain oatmeal and, and, you know, a fatty, fattier mixed meal uh, of oatmeal mm-hmm. is like, is amazing for people. Yeah. I, when I, I uh, Oh, Sorry. When I, yeah, when I was diagnosed, like I was familiar with nutrition, I was working out. So I didn't have a hard mm-hmm. like intro into diabetes. Like I was familiar with counting carbs and all that. Well, cause but, you, you counted macros for years Yeah, and I years counted before. macros. Mm-hmm. And so I was familiar mm-hmm. with all that, but I still went to go see a dietitian cause I'm like, okay, what does she have to say? I have to take insulin now. So what am I going to learn from this? And she went into, you know, different fats with meals or maybe even protein can spike your um, blood sugars. It's different for every person. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. I would have never thought of that. So as you guys are yeah. saying, like knowledge is power because you can use it for good. And I also, I think you mentioned this in the last podcast with Dr. Nick, but you know, you, you mentioned that if you take walks after dinner mm-hmm. or after meals, you notice that your, your blood sugar on your CGM is lower. And I, Loved that you mentioned that and the peanut butter thing, because I think that um, so much of our like dietary, philo- you know, the, the, the rhetoric around diets these days is about deprivation. And I think, and like eliminating things and having to cut things out of your life. But I think what we're learning from CGM and, and our users is that it's not actually about necessarily limiting things, it's modulating things. Mm-hmm. And it's creating the context for these foods that makes the glycemic response better. So whether that's preloading with protein, fat, or vinegar, which all have been shown to blunt glucose spikes or getting extra sleep or having better stress management practices or, you know, any of the doing intermittent fasting or any of these things that are like evidence-based strategies to kind of modulate glycemic spikes, like you can kind of experiment and sort of biohack um, to figure out like, how can you eat these foods that you love, but within sort of a a greater context that allows you to have a healthier metabolic response to them. So I love that aspect of this and that it's like empowering and expands options as opposed to kind of limiting or, or, uh, you know, restricting. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So the the two things I was going to say from that was, um, kind of like the modulating thing. Um, Mm -hmm we're on quarantine and stuff now, you know, with everything going on, but we will do CrossFit early in the morning at the 6 30 AM class. And I mm. never thought I would be a person who wakes up and to work out. Like I like to do it after I'm awake during the day after work. And so we started doing that for about a year, um, maybe a year and a half now. And I notice if I work out in the morning, the rest of the day, my blood sugars will cooperate way more. Mm. And I, I'm like, wow. Like, and then the days we wouldn't work out in the morning, um, mainly, they, mainly because I slept in and said I didn't want to work out. <laughs> John is the worst. I wasn't gonna influence. call you out. John is the worst. Let's just, influence let's just say it. What it is? My <laughs> oh, my hips are tight today. The, day, the days she doesn't out. work out are the days where I said no. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. But I would notice my blood sugar would be a little bit more elevated, and then now it's a whole different trying to figure out what works now because we're mostly at home but it's just so interesting to see the data and then apply it to what works for your life and then also another thing I was going to say too to bring into a question was um if I'm with friends 
the joke is I always talk about diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like CrossFit. Isn't it? <laughs> it's either, either talk about CrossFit or diabetes. Yeah. But I'll check my blood sugar. And if it's a little higher than I would like, I'm like, oh, my blood sugar is high. And a, a friends will always say, oh, what did you eat? And I'm like, no, I'm just like really, really stressed. Like, you know, I, I can tell. And that's why my blood sugar is higher. So I know you mentioned, I think it was one of your articles that um, you need to look inward um, for your health. And I know your blood sugar will affect so many different, I mean, everything will affect your blood sugar. So like sleep, stress, exercise. Can you go into a little bit more about that? Especially the exercise, because I know most people say, oh yeah, exercise, it's good for you. But I know it can affect different things too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, no, 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 we, can, we can tag team this one. I think, um, yeah, I think exercise, we do focus a lot on food in relation to glucose. And it's amazing how profound an impact that exercise has on our glycemic regulation. And what's really cool is that, I mean, there are dozens and dozens of studies that looking how, um, at how different types of exercise affect our, our insulin sensitivity um, and our glucose levels. And what's really neat is that almost every type of exercise has been shown to improve glycemic control. So you can do resistance training, walking, high intensity interval training, yoga. There are studies to suggest that pretty much any way that you're moving your body can very quickly improve insulin sensitivity. So even doing one high intensity interval training session can, can improve insulin sensitivity the next day, which is really, I think what, what you're talking about with your own Mm -hmm. experience. And so I think that's really hopeful. It's not like there's one magic bullet exercise that does this. And it's just, I think it's going to be great for people to sort of try different things and see what has the best impact on their glycemic control. But, but the good news is that whatever you do, it, it works, even the simplest stuff. So there was some really interesting research showing, looking at basically who people who walked, um, just for, you know, about 30, 30 minutes a day, um, or, 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 and basically what they, they were looking at is, um, how uh, different sort of regimens of walking throughout the day most impact glycemic control. And they looked at people who walked um, basically before every meal, after every meal for, uh, sorry, I'm getting the numbers a little wrong, but I think it was 20 minutes before each meal, 20 minutes after each meal, or so that was a total of 60 minutes per day, or just walking for like two minutes every half hour throughout the day. So all of those added up to 60 minutes per day. And they actually found that the people who walked two, just for two minutes per day, but multiple times throughout the day, like every 30 minutes had better glycemic control and post-meal glucose spikes. So there was this idea that actually more regular movement all throughout the day is better for glycemic function. So that's kind of interesting. And, you know, there's not one dogmatic thing that I would say about what people should do in regards to movement, except that they should move (laughs) and they should do it. (laughs) Not, they should be doing it throughout the day and anything that they'll be consistent with. Um, So yeah, that's, that's just a few things I would say, Josh, do you want to jump in about anything else? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I see it myself. Um, I kind of mentioned I'm like a hyper responder. Uh, I I certainly on the the levels team, I have the worst glucose control and uh, (laughs) it's kind of the reason that I actually like originally wanted to start this because I found out that I was borderline pre-diabetic. I was definitely pre -pre pre-diabetic in certain days. I would, I would be a full blown pre-diabetic, uh, with the first time I used the CGM and it it completely changed my life. But, um, I've been a, a CrossFit instructor for a while. I was, I'm a level two now. And, uh, I, I find that it's fascinating how nuanced, exercise is like the difference for me in seeing a, a two hour run, you know, just a slow, it's like, or it's like a jog, you know, a two hour jog completely depletes my glycogen and my glucose control or my glucose levels like slowly, but, but monotonically decrease throughout the run versus a high intensity, you know, seven thirty in the morning barbell workout where my blood sugar reaches 190, 195 afterwards, you know, it's intensity. It's all out hundred percent effort. These two things look completely different on a CGM, but both of them have a really profound effect on like on insulin sensitivity and on the ability for your body to, uh, you know, ultimately what your body's going to do immediately after is ramp up insulin sensitivity in order to maximize glycogen replenishment. So it's trying to get those muscles back into their prior pre-workout condition. And that it doesn't matter, you know, although it looks different on the CGM, the way that I, you know, I see my glucose response throughout the next day. And, and in some cases, if I have a really intense workout, like I'll see better glucose control for multiple days afterward. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it's just, it's amazing. Like it, it keeps me 
I'm actually more dedicated to fitting some type of exercise in every day now than I ever have been in my life. Even though previous to starting this company, I was much more interested in the aesthetics, like the physical fitness uh, component. I didn't really think about nutrition at all. Um, and, and it's fascinating now that like the, the seeing the physiologic data actually has gone full circle. And I, I appreciate exercise even more now than I ever have as a result of it. That's awesome. And I think one funny thing to follow up on what Josh said with the, the CGM, like different responses, but same sort of overall improvement in insulin sensitivity. We get some people who are a little freaked out when they do a really high intensity interval workout, because you, you actually, for some of these people will see glucose rise on CGM, like quite profoundly during the workout. And like Josh alluded to, that's the physiology of that is because the body has an overwhelming sort of stress catecholamine response, which tells with epinephrine and other stress hormones that tells the liver to just dump out glycogen in the, in, into the into the bloodstream as glucose and actually in, in increases uh, liver glycogen breakdown eightfold, like wow. instantly, because you need to have all this need, the muscle wants all this glucose, but the actual uptake by the muscles is only about a three to four X increase. So you get this basically like exaggerated glucose response because the body's trying really hard to provide you with the energy you need. And so that you know, it is a glucose elevation, but it's actually not a maladaptive one. It's different physiology than a food related spike. And over time, like Josh mentioned, you know, sh should lead to better insulin sensitivity. So, so you kind of start learning. It's, it's funny. Cause I think some of us now, when we're working out really hard, we'll actually kind of judge the intensity of our workout by whether we get a glucose <laughs> run during the workout. Yeah. And I think the other really fun application of CGM to working out is that there's a lot of talk, um, I think in the endurance athlete community about, um, actually working out more in a fasted low glycogen state, because, um, you may be able to actually, by working out with insulin low and glucose stores low, you can tap into more of the fat oxidation pathways. And we only have, you know, a few hundred minutes of glycogen stores for energy in a workout, but we have like days worth of fat storage for energy to, to fuel endurance workouts. But because we don't, we're not a culture that often is in a low carb state. So we're kind of rarely fat oxidizing as a population as a whole. And so those pathways just aren't utilized very much for energy. Um, and this kind of like shows up with our obesity epidemic. Um, we're just not fat oxidizing super well. And so by exercising in this low glucose, low glycogen, low insulin state over time, it, you know, you may be able to access those pathways more efficiently and in times of endurance needs for workouts, actually be able to kind of perform longer, um, by, by just having those, those pathways more accessible. So, um, I certainly have, as I've used CGM, tried to shift my, um, long runs and just sometimes doing it more in a fasted state just to try and get that. And that term, the term for this is called metabolic flexibility. So being able to access both carbs for energy, but also fat oxidation pathways for energy, fat burn. And so, um, so you can kind of just like watch this stuff happening on, you know, the screen as you're working out and, um, tap into just some new interesting stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. One of our, one of the guys on our team, uh, Mike, you know, he, he's like also just completely up, uprooted and renovated his lifestyle from CGM data, but it's really cool. He's, he's pushing the limits on what he's saying. Like he'll do a 16 or 18 hour fast overnight and then, uh, he'll go and do a 15 mile run. Ooh. And the reason he's doing this is he'll then post a picture of his glucose data and his blood sugar will actually slightly increase like four, four or five points, you know, very, very to almost totally flat. And this goes wow. drives hard in, in the other direction from what mainstream opinion would be is that if you so much as get out of bed without eating a snack, your blood sugar is going to plummet. You're going to go hypoglycemic. You're going to have no, no energy, your fatigues and stuff, you know, all these ears out running out of glycogen or something like this. And the reality is that in certain exercise regimes, you are way more flexible and certainly training those regimes will in increase your flexibility even further. So it's really cool stuff. I, uh, I can't like, this is a, an area like really lifting the hood on, uh, on enhancing exercise and understanding fueling strategies. This is like really where we can contribute. Yeah. That, um, just the idea of metabolic flexibility is like super interesting to me. Um, because I, I was reading, I don't remember the name of the book, but it was this book and it was, and, um, it was a running book or something. And they were you talking were, you about, you were reading a running book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, and it was like talking about the importance of like fat oxidation that you were talking about using, 
um, low carb and, and using the fats for the longer endurance. And, and it was almost like there was no option. It was either you are carb or you are fat. There mm-hmm. is, no, you know what I mean? Like, and so to hear something like, and I feel like for most things, like, Everyone loves to live on the extremes when mm-hmm. it's like yeah. there's a happy middle, but no one wants to talk about the happy middle. So it's like mm. metabolic flexibility and being able to use your data, um, your you know insulin levels, car- all that stuff, like to monitor that is like super intriguing to me because it, again, it's like it goes away. It, the the extremes are so like sexy, if you will. They're so like attractive. People like going into the extremes and then arguing with the other side of the extreme, but like seeing like that possibility of metabolic um, flexibility is like super intriguing to me, you know, cause it doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting because like for me, I, uh, I did a marathon last year and I am, <laughs> I, I like, I am not fat oxidized. I'm not like fat for me. I struggle with using that as fuel for sure. Like I know that for a fact, cause when I did my marathon one, I was an idiot, went out way too hot, PR'd my PR, PR'd my half marathon during it. Not a good idea. Mile 17, <laughs> I completely crashed and I ended up having to, um, I had to like eat half a banana. I had some salt. I drank a little bit more water. I was like, they had the like electrolyte stuff and, Eventually, I started feeling better, but I mean, it was rough. Like, I had to start walking for about a mile. Mm. And I just remember, like, the feeling of just, like, it it just did not feel good. And then, like, uh, recently, I think it was two days ago, I went on a a pretty long run for me. It was, like, 10 miles. And that is definitely, like, for me, that is the cap of what I can do without having, like, water with me and, like, nutrition and stuff like that with me because... I, my body isn't there yet. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not using fat. Like I, I should have had something with me. Like that was my fault. Now I know, and I won't do that again, but it's really interesting. The kind of, like Jean was saying, like being able to find that middle ground of being able to use both because like, it's like, uh, <laughs> like the, uh, those old, um, commercials from that little girl when they're talking about like hard soft hard taco or soft taco and she's like why not both <laughs> like, like, that's what I'm thinking. like why not use both because then you can be you can have both and and then the other thing that we were kind of talking about and that I think is interesting and it's something I've, I've mentioned before is um, talking about kind of like breakfast and the American obsession with breakfast mm-hmm. um, it's one of the things that I don't want to say it frustrates me, but it's something I have to deal with a lot when I'm working with people or talking with people is that they think they, they think they need to have breakfast. Like it's been driven home for so many years. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It's the most important meal of the day. It's the most important meal of the day. And I mean, your first meal of the day, it could be, I would say that it is important, but it doesn't need to be right when you wake up. You know, it could be a little bit later, like if you want to use intermittent fasting or even if you just don't want to call it that, but just push back your first meal, like something that I do, I've done this for years now is I wake up, I work out in the morning and then I'll eat afterwards. Cause like, mm-hmm. I don't feel good if I have a bunch of food in my stomach and then I'm trying to work out. But that's one of the things that like, I, I, I have to t- talk to people so much is that like, you don't need to eat right when you wake up, especially if you ate dinner the night before you went to sleep. You, you, you ate six hours ago, seven hours ago. You don't need to eat right now, you know? And I think that that people having the knowledge and being able to see the numbers, they're like, oh yeah, I I really don't need to. I don't need to just listen to whatever Joe is saying, you know? Joe. 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 (laughs) Well, it's so interesting how you were talking about, um, the other guy on the team where he, you know, he fasted for a while and then won that super long run. It's because, you know, we all want to eat constantly. Like, ooh, there's a snack. Ooh, mm-hmm. my other second lunch and stuff. John. <laughs> I'm not looking at you. <laughs> they, they, like, they, they keep talking about all these people. <laughs> it's John. <laughs> it's me and John. <laughs> and I, right, I we heard picking some, up on the code. <laughs> yeah. I heard somewhere where it's like, you don't have to be intermittent fasting like a certain time frame every day, but it's okay to have like a day where you fast for a few hours. It's like, you don't need to be eating during that time. And I was like, Oh my goodness. Like, should I be fasting? And then I was like, (laughs) thinking about it. And I was like, we go to bed super early. We eat dinner at like six. And then when we work out in the morning, I'm not eating again until like 10 in the morning after I have my workout. So I go, Oh, I am fasting. And I look Mm -hmm. at my CGM and look at the data and it's not like I'm plummeting. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. That's one of the, it's just one of the really interesting benefits is like, um, people don't 
they, there's, there's always this, uh, there's just, you build routines, right? There's three meals, three square meals a day and snacks in between. It's like, I remember when I was in college, the, the, uh, dietary advice of the moment was eat as many small meals as you can, mm. you know, nine mm-hmm. meals, 10 meals. If you can do 12 meals, like you're better off than the guy doing 10. So it was just, we were constantly eating. And, um, the idea was you're revving up your metabolism or something like that. And I don't know, maybe there's some of that going on. I, I have, I'm not really going to dig in there, but I will say that the independence that you can develop from realizing that nothing bad will happen if you go without food for a few hours in the morning. And in fact, nothing bad will happen for most people if you go the whole day. You know, it's, it's an interesting experiment. I, I've done multi-day fasts with a glucose monitor on, and I've watched as all the erratic movement just sort of slowly steadies out into a flat line. And then my blood sugar just maintains and I'm just cruising. And eventually after multiple days of that, I run out of glycogen and I transition over to ketones and my ketone levels go up and my glucose is still there. You know, I'm not, I'm not passing away, but, but you know, the, the physiologic processes are there. This is a, this is actually a really natural state. And if you think about a, a few tens of thousands of years ago, before we had, you know, a million ca- calories within walking distance everywhere we were, like people went without food for multiple days at a time. And, th- and in fact, that was when they needed to perform the best. That's when you have to, that's when you really have your life on the line. You've got to get food. And so you need to be thinking clearly and acting, uh, you know, correctly and with enough energy to hunt down that, you know, that wild animal or, you know, go forage for, for plants, you know, whatever it was that, that you relied on for food, you had to be able to perform to get that done and you had to perform without food. And so I think it's, it's a very natural state to be fasted and to be in on a low calorie environment. And, uh, something that I think people don't realize until they see the data and realize that they they're perfectly safe without, without that snack. And I, I would just add, you know, that when we think about what, what is a snack from like a physiologic perspective, if we're assuming that, the snack has some carbohydrates in it, um, which I think most of our snack food does in our country, you know, that means that you're not only going to get a little bit of a glucose bump, most likely, but you're also going to have an insulin bump. And so most likely. And so what that means is that, you know, as opposed to having maybe one insulin spike in the morning, and then maybe one at night, if you're eating a late breakfast and dinner, you might be having a bunch of these throughout the day and may never actually get to a place where your insulin is, you know, back to baseline if you're constantly snacking throughout the day and same with glucose. And so when you think about like the physiology of what's happening in the body with that, like there's a lot of downstream potential ramifications for that, even for someone who does not have diabetes. So, you know, high glucose in the blood can lead to lots of different processes. It can lead to inflammation. It can lead to oxidative stress. Um, and it can also lead to glycation of proteins and fats, which is basically glucose just getting stuck to these things in the cells because there just happens to be a high concentration of glucose in the blood. And so glycation can alter, you know, cellular parts in a way that's not good. And, um, you know, perturbs their function. So you, you, I like to think of it as like, I'm trying to lower my glucose exposure, you know, of my cells and my fat and my proteins in my body to excessive glucose. And that means not just not having kind of constant hyperglycemia, but also just eliminating these spikes. And the same goes with insulin. If insulin is kind of always up there, because we're always eating and snacking, um, that's going to make the cells, it's going to, it's going to push down that path of insulin resistance. Cause as the cells see that insulin all the time, and it's constantly binding with the insulin receptors, it's going to generate that numbness to insulin that we see in insulin resistance, which is a spectrum. And so, yeah, so I kind of, in my head frame it around, you know, as I'm looking at my glucose curve on the levels app throughout the day, I'm, I'm sort of giving myself a pat on the back if I'm keeping it in a stable and healthy range. Um, if I, I know that I'm minimizing this sort of cellular exposure to these things that I know can cause sort of downstream, not great physiology. And, um, and that doesn't mean fasting all the time. It just means being smart about how I'm pairing foods, how I'm, you know, doing my exercise and lifestyle stuff and, and avoiding the foods that are kind of known big triggers for me. So that's, yeah, that's just kind of how I frame it in my head. So I'm going to ask a um, hypothetical question. So if you can't answer it, it's totally fine. But um, <laughs> like this actually is, it's not, oh, okay. <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. I know a friend. No, uh, <laughs> so can you, we're talking about like insulin sensitivity and, and going heavy on carbs, make your insulin go up and down, up and down, up and down. Can you be, by all other markers, healthy, but 
mess your insulin so much up that you put your body at a state of insulin insensitivity? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so like if you're exercising regularly and you're whatever, like you're drinking water and you're getting good sleep and you're not stressed, um, but the way you eat is just so many carbs, carb loading it up, and, and your insulin is just going crazy. Can that hurt your pancreas? Like, or you know what I mean? Do you guys get what I'm trying to ask? Yeah. So yeah. I, I would uh, just just so I can clarify, um, there would be other markers that would be irregular before you get to the point where you're damaging your organs in case you please jump in but like before you get to the point where you're damaging your organs or, or your metabolic function you would probably see things like induced hyperglycemia like if you're eating so many carbs that you're causing hyperinsulinemia and burning out your beta cells in your pancreas you're probably having it, like high glucose situations pretty regularly um, and then doing that over time, like multiplying that out over months and years is where the burnout happens, where like the damage happens. Do you agree with that, Casey? Yeah, I would say so. And I think that, I think part of the question also is like, if if you're living like a really incredibly optimized, healthy lifestyle, but but kind of the dietary piece is not totally there, can you still get yourself into a bad situation uh, metabolically? And I think the answer is definitely Yes. Um, I think that, you know, diet is a huge driver of this stuff. There are many mitigating factors, but, um, you know, even amongst performance athletes, um, you can still see uh, pretty, you can still see metabolic dysfunction, um, even if outwardly looking lean and healthy and, and muscular. And um, Josh, I don't know if you, I know you that the study that, uh, you have um, referenced a couple of times, but I don't remember it right off the top of my head. Yeah. But like it's how many percentage so, of athletes? Yeah, there was a, um, it's, it's, it's glycemic responses in sub elite athletes. I can't remember the title, but basically what happened is they took 10, uh, what they call sub elite athletes. This is a New Zealand study. And uh, my understanding of sub elite in this category is like an amateur athlete, somebody who's in like a sub pro tour. Um, but anyway, they took these, these 10 people and the intention of the study was as stated, to show what metabolic like perfection or excellence looks like. The expectation is that somebody who is at this level is going to have really exceptional glycemic control. And in fact, uh, 75% of them spent a significant portion of every day in the pre-diabetic zone. And three of them were actually pre-diabetic. And uh, this was without their knowledge. And and what I think is really fascinating here is that um, this could be a transient situation that they're in. Like, I, I actually believe that they are temporarily pre-diabetic. And if they were to just change their behaviors, you know, it, and this is one of the issues we have, as you were saying previously with the extremes, it's like, oh, now you're pre-diabetic and next comes diabetes. Well, that's actually not true. It's just currently you're in a pre-diabetic state. And, and again, I wanna, I wanna be clear, this is type two diabetes is a different physiology and onset, but uh, you're in a temporary pre-diabetic state. And if you were to change your behaviors and like maybe stop spiking, it's possible. I don't know what these people's diets were, but you know, there's a lot of things like energy gel, and, and carbohydrate drinks and uh, a lot of stuff that's just pure sugar. And that definitely is helpful if you're like pushing for the last you know, stage of the Tour de France. But do you need that to go lift weights in your backyard? Probably not. And a lot of people don't know, they don't have enough information to be making those fueling decisions. So they're inducing, I think, this, this like irregularity, the, the spikes and crashes are, are caused by what they're like, uh, you know, putting in their bodies. And this showed up in that study sub, with the sub elite athletes. It's really fascinating. Um, there, you know, there's another company called Verta Health that uh, is doing some amazing work on dietary uh, induced remission of type two diabetes. And the founder of that company, Sami Inkinen, I think the year that he won, or he was like placed very, very highly in the Kona uh, full Ironman, nice. he yeah. uh, finishes this race and then is promptly diagnosed with pre-diabetes and that led him <laughs> to start the company Verta Health. And so oh, this wow. is like, this is actually fairly common what you, to your, to your question. Like I think people are with the tools that we have and the like caloric availability that we have today, it's like actually easier to give yourself a chronic illness of abundance than it is to, <laughs> to end up in a yeah. bad situation in the other direction. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. Kind of like what you were saying is something that I, I'd say that um, CrossFit has actually been talking a lot about recently is like, um, fitness and health are kind of different things, you know, like someone can be incredibly fit and like 
like you said, like going to the Iron Man, doing the Iron Man and Kona, and doing that, and then being diagnosed with prediabetes. Like, just because someone is super fit, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're super healthy. And I right. think that that's that's a really interesting um, thing to bring up. One thing that I wanted to talk about. It's been on my mind this whole time. So we've been talking a lot about kind of like ketogenesis, being an, on a keto diet. And <laughs> I've talked quite a bit about keto. Um, I've made many videos about keto. Um, and that's more at a, from a weight loss point of view. And so I was just curious as to like, if you guys, do you guys practice keto or does it, are you guys just kind of limiting the amount of carbs that you're eating, you know, because like the, the, the issues that I've had with keto, just putting all my cards on the table is that when it comes to the weight loss space, a lot of people are treating it as a magic bullet as like, you just need to be keto and you can actually eat as many calories as you want and you'll still lose weight uh, because your insulin will be regulated kind of thing is basically, that's like, you, I'm sure you guys know all this stuff, right? Super layman's terms. That's kind of what is being said. And I personally believe that calories are king. If you're trying to lose weight, you have to be in a deficit, right? And so I was just, I, I would love if you guys could maybe explain what you guys think. If you guys disagree with me, that's totally fine. But I, I'm, I'm just genuinely curious as to like how you guys feel about that. Yeah, I, I think I'll jump in. Um, so I certainly am not someone who subscribes to like strongly to a ketogenic diet or a ketogenic lifestyle. I think like um, defining sort of a ketogenic diet as people who are going to be focusing about 80 to 85 percent fat, mm -hmm. uh, macronutrient percentage, and somewhere about 10 percent proteins, five to 10 percent carbohydrates, trying to get less than between 30 and 50 grams of carbs, net carbs a day. I'd say that's like a rough picture mm -hmm. of ketogenesis. That's not even you know remotely what what I follow. I, I probably eat well over 100 carbs a day. My focus is much more on. Um, keeping glucose levels in the blood stable, which is actually very different than carb intake. Um, and that's because everyone's unique physiology and body and microbiome and genetics is going to process carbohydrates differently in terms of how it leads to a glucose elevation in the blood. So it's much more important for me um, to think about just how to keep glucose stable. And that does not necessarily translate to totally like low carb living. Um, it, it translates to very thoughtful you know, holistic approach to diet and lifestyle, which I think is more, more important. And I think that another thing I think to really mention is that the, the pathophysiology of insulin resistance is not a one-to-one -one relationship with carbs and glucose. There's a lot of other things at play that promote insulin resistance. So general inflammation in the body, intracellular lipid storage, and, and fat accumulation within cells that can perturb the function of the insulin receptor. Um, you know, uh, adipose tissue, fat tissue in the body is thought to be more and more considered to be an endocrine organ in its own right. in that it, it secretes these cytokines called, um, adipokines, which can kind of promote this low grade inflammatory status that's associated with insulin resistance. So there's a, it's a really complex physiology. Mm -hmm. And so my, my sort of dietary philosophy as both a physician and just a person trying to be healthy is, really to just um, keep levels of inflammation in the body low through a, a very wholesome, whole foods rich diet, um, promoting mitochondrial function with as much micronutrient support as possible, you know, for, for the mitochondria in the cells to, to churn through glucose effectively, they have to have all these little um, cofactors to, to just work. And so just making sure the diet is very, very nutrient packed and rich um, and that like I said, inflammation is low and, and glucose levels maintain, maintain a good level in the blood. So it's much more than just carbs. I think it's, it's really, in my opinion, just a comprehensive, um, uh, wholesome diet and, and good lifestyle choices. And what I would say wholesome diet is from my perspective is eating as close to the earth as possible, eating whole foods, unrefined, unprocessed foods, um, and, and trying to choose really healthy fat sources that are going to kind of decrease inflammation. So omega three fats, um, and, uh, yeah. And limiting sort of inflammatory omega six fats and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know if that, that's a little bit of a all over the place answer, but, but, um, definitely think it's more than just limiting carbs. Mm -hmm. 
No, yeah, that was great. I I appreciate you answering answering the question. Just because I I we had been kind of talking about it a lot, and I just uh, for me personally, I w- I wanted uh, uh, just to learn a little bit more about that and kind of see what you guys thought about that. Just because it's a I mean that's a big topic that people are talking a lot about, and I I mean I think I think it's very interesting, and I think there's a lot of um, applications where the keto diet has obviously been really helpful for people. Um, but again, it's just like kind of you guys have already said, if it's there's there's no one size fits all for everybody. And I think that that's so important, you know, and I think that that's kind of what we've been talking about this whole time is that it's personalized and this is something that helps you find out what's best for you. And I think that's why it's so great. Yeah. And and just as there's amazing literature coming out of the keto research, you know, Sarah Hallberg, um, medical director of Verda Health has published some incredible research from Verda showing that a ketogenic low carb diet is is incredible at reversing um, metabolic dysfunction and actually with results in as little as like 10 weeks reversing wow. type two diabetes. It's incredible. But just like that's one body of literature. There's also amazing literature coming out of sort of the more plant-based community showing that a actually high carb, low fat, um, whole foods, plant-based diet. So very healthy, unrefined, unprocessed is also effective mm-hmm. at lowering hemoglobin A1C. So just like what you said, I think um, there's many different ways to arrive at, um, healthy physiology. And, um, I think a common denominator is, uh, yeah, eating wholesome, nutrient rich, unprocessed, not refined carb foods. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I was going to say is it that none of them are saying that your breakfast should be pop tarts (laughs) or, you know, and, and for a while, I mean, that was, I'll write my own paper. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was the, pop, uh, the pop that was all paper. the that was all a rage for a while. It was like, who cares? Yeah. Like, carbs are carbs. You're well, fine. It was yeah. it was the pendulum thing that we always talk about. Yeah. You know, for the longest time, it was like only eat chicken and broccoli, and that's mm-hmm. it. And then it was like, well, if you track your macros, you can, you know, you like, can eat all the Oreos exactly. and, yeah. Yeah. It, the, and, yep. and then the pendulum, yeah. I think, has been swinging a little bit more in the other direction as of late. Um, yeah. There's still a lot of people that are. I mean, I still recommend people track their macros, but I don't recommend that you eat pop tarts because because it fits, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, why mm-hmm. would you do that? And I think once you start to learn more, you're like, I don't want to fit pop tarts in because I can have one when instead I could eat an abundance of these things and it would equal the same amount, you know? So yep. it, it's been interesting seeing the, the pendulum's always swinging in, in some way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the caloric model of a calorie is a cal- calorie, just the caloric model of weight loss and weight, weight uh, fluctuation is, is in my opinion, easily debunked. It's, it is, accurate at the highest level. Like it is true that food contains energy and those are called calories. We use that. The, the, the calorie is one, one unit of, of energy, but it is not true that the same piece of food that goes into each of our bodies is going to produce the same amount of energy in each of us. And the mm-hmm. difference there is the way that our physiology, the way that our metabolism breaks that food down into cellular energy. Like those two things are impacted by your genetic environment, your hormone uh, levels, uh, and your, your digestive system, your microbiome. There's all, all this stuff going on. You can't have that many dampers in between the input and the output and call it like a calorie is a calorie. It's just not true. And then when you see uh, CGM data, that's where you realize that uh, once again, I can eat 60 grams of wheat bran that is just literally the the shell outside the wheat grain and my blood sugar is rock solid because that's essentially 100 percent fiber and then i can eat 60 grams of carbohydrates and or you know i could eat the same number of net net carbs uh, of pop tarts which would probably be like you know half a pop tart and my blood sugar <laughs> goes through the roof right mm-hmm. so so yeah. it's like glycemic uptake the, the the pace with which those carbs get into my bloodstream is completely different. And what that's going to do is induce a different insulin response. And if my yeah. goal is to have energy for the gym, I don't want to blast off with a pop tart and then come crashing back down right as I'm picking the barbell up. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, like that's, I, I just, uh, I, I completely understand. I, I used to subscribe to the concept of calories were calories, but it's, uh, it's pretty easily debunked, I think with better data. Yeah. I always, I always struggled with the idea of someone who ate, you know, chicken breast or whatever and sweet potatoes whatever that protein and carb ratio was and someone who ate fruit loops and some protein powder were uh, feeding their body the same way. It was just Mm -hmm. like, there's no way like, yes, those (laughs) macros are the same. I imagine, I guess, but there's no way that that, that has the same response on your body. Um, and Mm -hmm. so hearing a lot more of like the, Hey, like let's, let's look at what we're eating, not just how much of it, um, really is like 
Okay, good. Yeah. I, I like this. I can a get big, into this. A big thing I think that was going on was people were just super focused on how you look eating certain things. And um, I, I, I'm not a prof- like expert on all that stuff, but it seemed like the macro, whatever you, it, it didn't affect your your physique as much as it affects your health. You know, like if you're, you might be eating pop tarts and protein powder and you might look just as good in quotes as the guy that's eating sweet potatoes and chicken breast, but your insides are not the same, you know? And I think now (laughs) more people are focusing on their insides and the health just in general, that even the fitness space, I think is kind of swinging a little bit more in that direction of, okay, maybe you're fit, but like we said, are you healthy? And um, mm-hmm. some people, it's it's shown that the way that they were eating, it it wasn't, they're not, you know? And I mean, I, I'm not perfect. I definitely don't have the best diet in the world, but I'm always trying to get a little bit better at it. And I was even the person that was trying to fit things in. And I made videos about, you know, when I first found out about macro, I was like, oh my gosh, I could eat this stuff and I could fit these things in. I never got super crazy with it because I found it after I had lost a lot of weight. So I was like always aware that I don't want to become, you know, 400 pounds again. So I'm not going to go super crazy, but it was like, oh, I can have this stuff. But now it's like, okay, like even oatmeal, I've like started cutting that out because like I don't feel good eating it. And so I don't mm-hmm. want to eat that thing. You know, it's, 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 it's very interesting interesting for sure. Yeah. Well, I will say though, from the looks perspective, I feel like there's actually some good, some good evidence to support that people who do just want to like look good, you know, actually monitoring glucose, even at non-diabetic levels is actually potentially a really like low hanging fruit. Um, there has been some interesting research showing that people who have severe acne, the like uh, medication refractory acne who go on low glycemic diets for as little as 12 weeks can have a statistically significant decrease in acne, even after wow. failing multiple medic, uh, multiple, um, medication therapies. And the science behind it is really interesting. Hyperglycemia can actually activate genetic pathways. This one in particular called mTOR, which upregulates basically the cells desire to, uh, the, the cells, um, desire to replicate and divide more frequently. And that can affect the oil producing glands in the skin and they'll produce more oil and you'll get these big sebaceous glands around the hair follicles and that predisposes to acne. So you actually Take, can take biopsies of people who have done of the skin of people who have done this low glycemic intervention and see that their spacious glands are smaller and their acne is markedly reduced. So that I think that's just fascinating. And the the other one that, that listeners might be interested in is actually wrinkles. Um, so part of the you know we just think of <laughs> here we go like, Sam 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 Sam's ready to hear. <laughs> We think of something like like wrinkles as like part of the aging process. And we think a lot about sun damage, all of which is true. But when you break down what is the aging process, part of it is sort of moving along the spectrum of metabolic dysfunction, increased blood sugar levels. And, um, and one of the ways that wrinkles occur is that collagen proteins, collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. It's in the skin and collagen is what kind of gives you that nice skin turgor, um, when it gets glycated by excess glucose and, gl- and sugar is sticking all over it, it actually forms these sort of bunches that are not good and cross links in, in a maladaptive way. And that is part of why wrinkles occur. And mm. you can actually reduce glycated collagen by being on a low glycemic diet. And there's not like intensive research out there showing that you can reverse wrinkles with you know, tight glucose management, but the physiology underlying it is very, very strong. Um, and then I think the third mechanism that's interesting is that high hyperglycemia really affects small vessels in the body. So again, the, the glucose can kind of stick in and get sticky inside these little vessels and cause poor blood flow in the capillaries. And that underlies a lot of disease associated with diabetes, like, you know, retinal problems, erectile dysfunction, kidney disease, et cetera. But also, you know, those capillaries are what supply the skin. And so just kind of like, you know, you see someone and you're like, oh, they look really healthy. And part of that is probably really good capillary flow in their skin and really good blood flow. And, um, and so for all these reasons, you know, there's, even if it's just, just vanity and just looks as kind of one of the drivers, I think there is a role for, for monitoring glucose, um, for those reasons. So certainly helps. I'm sold. <laughs> yeah. I want one. <laughs> that's that's so interesting to hear because before I was diagnosed, like I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what it was like m- for months. And I struggled with acne during that time and I've never had acne. And I went to the dermatologist. I'm like, what is going on? And I'll look at 
pictures from like two years ago and it just insane like it just cleared up after i like, managed my blood sugar and wow. like the capillaries thing <laughs> you were going into detail with i also had huge bags under my eyes and mm. i've never had that either and i would look at myself and i even cried once i'm like what is going on i had what? like <laughs> because of this. <laughs> huge huge bags and i'm like something is wrong and i don't know what it is so that's just so interesting you went into detail about that yeah, yeah. that's fascinating um okay so we've talked a lot about um hyperglycemia uh um, well what go ahead yeah because we mentioned it before the serious question what that we want to get to yeah i know yeah yeah, yeah. so now let's talk Very about serious. hypoglycemia <laughs> um and the fact that ha- hanger, <laughs> Sol- solving Jean, Jean needs help. Jean, <laughs> Jean wants some help right now. Um, also, we blew past that forty minute mark. I got yeah. a, I got a notification from Zoom that said that they dismissed the limit. So that's cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, they, they said it was a gift. Uh, yeah, it's a gift to you. <laughs> I was confused when you said that. I was like, I've never had a problem with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hopefully they're listening in and they're like, oh, this conversation's awesome. We're going to keep going. Yeah, they're like, yeah. keep going. Like, keep it, going. Literally, it literally <laughs> popped up. It said the 40 limit, ti- forty minute time limit has been released or whatever. I was like, yeah. oh, cool. <laughs> um, so I've noticed we since she's had, uh, what is it called? Uh, we prick your finger. Oh, the meter? Meter, yeah, yeah. Blood sugar meter? I, th- yeah. I thought you were going to be like, diabetes? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what's um, that thing called you have? The, the common theme, every time I'm hangry, um, and, and it's funny that you brought it up because talking about, uh, you know, needing to hunt and, and, and go, uh, you know, like when you're hungry is when you start realizing, okay, it's probably time for me to hunt down an antelope and try to eat it or whatever. <laughs> like, um, and I always thought, Man, I would be screwed if I was like in a like a hunter gatherer society, because when I'm hungry, I'm out. Like I'm mad. Um, I have no energy. I feel like weak and shaky. Yeah. Um, and so I legitimately thought if I lived in a hunter gatherer society, I'd be dead because when I'm hungry, <laughs> just on the I'm ground, useless, completely <laughs> useless. Um, but when we measure my blood sugar it what is it when i'm hungry it was like 70s. 72 yeah, yeah like, like was the lowest like so like i'm in the low 70s and i've heard like the range typically is you want to be 80 to 120 or something mm-hmm. i don't know i don't but like so what what am i trying to ask well i'm going to piggyback off yeah, you yeah. because when i'm running high i'll be irritated and when mm-hmm. i'm running low i'll be super shaky i have like the low symptoms but i'll be irritable too but if he's hungry all the time and always irritable. Shouldn't his body be used to like a lower <laughs> blood sugar? Like he shouldn't be hangry anymore. <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah. So I guess we're asking just like the insulin <laughs> level and blood sugar on mood and um, like what's the correlation there? Strong. We've seen that. Yeah. Okay. See, I'll let you uh, dig in a little bit, but just anecdotally, like the when I first kind of looked into getting glucose information, it was um, I, I was working at SpaceX at the time and was like sort of reaching this point in my my age or career. I wasn't quite sure, but I was just completely fatigued. Like every day, I was feeling like I was hitting rock bottom, and it was interesting. It was it was always around the same time of day. And I would be irritable. I'd, be, I'd have meetings. I'd be, you know, going into these meetings upset and like not just generally not in control of my uh, of my like demeanor. And I was blaming this like low energy situation. Looking back on it now, when I got my CGM, I was finding that almost it, almost every meal I was eating. I mean, at that point in my life, was causing a sustained high hyperglycemic situation, and then a huge crash. And that crash like is where I got hungry, but also where I got extremely fatigued and my mood went just right out the, the window. Like I was in a, in a garbage mood for, for hours afterward. And that like, it was almost like that hormonal cascade of crashing and, and it happened very quickly. And I would dip down, you know, into the sixties. And in a lot of these cases after being up at like 180, um, that situation, like whatever hormones are being released, I think many of them are catecholamines. Um, uh, they are, 
or, or glucocorticoids, but basically you have like these stress responses that like these hormones react to your energy levels and, and induce additional energy responses. And, and some of these are like cortisol, right? Cortisol is the thing that stresses that, that, that is like a stress hormone It is involved with the uncomfortable feeling of being stressed out and upset and your heart rate being elevated and, uh, you know, and just fight or flight response type hormones. And these are, if these are being released in the middle of your work day, uh, it's hard to, to not have a mood effect and not have a fatigue effect. And so, um, over time, like I've, I now have, I would say much better mood and energy control over uh, across the board. Like I, I, it's not to say that I have, you know, the highest highs and I'm like, you know, killing it all day and I have superhuman energy. Uh, but I certainly don't have those crashes. They're completely, they're just gone. Um, so the underlying mood connection though is much stronger than my anecdote. And Casey, I, I think you should probably fill in the yeah. There. I mean, I think a lot of people have felt what you experienced, Josh. And, and I think, um, what you guys are, the question you posed and, and sort of the, the topic has been studied pretty well. And it's, it's pretty well established. I, I think you were mentioning that when your glucose is really high, you also notice that you're a little bit irritable. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So there was this really interesting study, um, done. It was, it was, it's a little bit of an old study. It's about 10 years old, but it was called, um, acute hyperglycemia alters mood state and impairs cognitive performance in people with diabetes. And basically what they did is they took people and they just acutely raised their blood sugar to 300 over a quick 20 minute period. And they found that, that the participants had a statistically, statistically significant uh, decrease in energetic arousal, which is basically their term for energy. And also like other sequelae were slower speeds of information processing, worse working memory and attention and increased sadness and anxiety. So it was just like this totally, you know, multimodal effects of this acute, um, high glucose spike. And I think so that, so we see that that's like, that's been seen in the, in the research, but then we also see that in states of reactive hypoglycemia, which is where glucose spikes and then comes down to sort of exaggerated low levels, um, you also can see increased anxiety, fatigue, um, reduced energy, uh, and mood issues during that time. And that the the process of that happening is that you know you you you, you know glucose rises, insulin surges, insulin causes the cells to soak up all this glucose, wants to get levels stable again. And then you have this exaggerated dip. And then that, and, and I think trying to figure out the link between these things, I think the simplest way to think about it is that like the brain, um, you know, the brain uses tons and tons and tons of glucose, and it's just exquisitely sensitive to glucose levels in the brain. It's almost like a barometer for glucose levels. And so if they're high, if they're low, if they're shifting quickly, there's going to be uh, a symptomatic effect in a lot of people. And so that's where just sort of a focus on, I think stability is really important. Um, it's amazing how much, uh, given it's amazing how much mental, processes seem to be affected by glucose. It's known that depression and anxiety are significantly higher, um, in people with diabetes, um, which is, and especially uncontrolled diabetes. And the same is true for, um, uh, lo lower energy states and fatigue, chronic fatigue in people with these conditions of overt metabolic dysfunction. Um, and, even things like fact recall have been studied that acute hyperglycemia can impair fact recall. So, um, you know, the brain is, it doesn't parse out these different things necessarily. The whole brain is getting affected by high glucose or, or big glucose plummets. And so you can kind of, I think it's reasonable to, to think, to understand, um, why all these sort of symptoms arise with this one underlying, uh, physiology. Um, yeah. So, I think stability is key. Um, in regards to the hanger question, um, that's really interesting. And I think my, I don't know that the answer exactly to why you would be feeling that intense hanger with a glucose of about 70, which, you know, should, is a, is a good amount of glucose in the blood. Um, you know, it's not catastrophically low. And I, I think my first gut instinct is to think that it probably has something to do with fat oxidation and the ability to be kind of maintaining energy, um, through other pathways when glucose is on the lower end, but yeah, I don't know the exact answer to that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I think interesting to see the trend, you know, is that, is that, so, is it just the point measurement is there and was it recently dipping? Did it just increase and drop? Like, is there cycles going on? That would be really fascinating. That, that yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I'm imagining is like every, <laughs> every meal involves carbs for me. 
um, and a lot of carbs. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get better. You've gotten, you've gotten better. Yeah, I'm trying to get better at it, but I do realize that like it's it's a huge dip, and so I'm interested to see if that. Um, translates on the meter you know like if that's exactly what i'm feeling and and when um is correlated yeah. to that time and so yeah it's it's interesting because it's just that one finger prick we're not seeing right. the yeah. hours before so exactly yeah that's the beauty is uh you know they're <laughs> taking a single point measurement and extrapolating it to like mm-hmm. everything about you yeah. is what yeah. we, we do today you know and it's it, it's just a consequence of technology's pace like technology outpaced the uh the current uh, screening standards it just got way better and now you have like full-time data availability but we just haven't gone back and renovated things and said, okay, yeah, this whole thing where we just took a single point measurement, that actually is not the gold standard. What's the gold standard is actually seeing how you respond to your decisions every day. Mm -hmm. Um, So we will get there. Like this is going to be a thing. Like people are, there's no way that you take this valuable, a data stream and, and make it like, you know, with time, it's becoming more, uh, you know, more affordable, more available and just less, clunky to use like the technology is just becoming really impressive and i think that the hardware is reaching the point where everyone's going to be able to learn these lessons themselves you won't have to take a point measurement and say you know this is how healthy you are based on this one data point mm. and uh, hopefully we never have to do that again <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool, I, I, want to, oh. I want you to try this because i feel like if that 72 is at the nadir of a post you know hyperglycemia reactive hypoglycemia spike you have you have your you kind of have your answer there yeah and yeah it's kind of exciting to think about uh, this. Yeah, it's been reflecting on that it could be that it could be that simple. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing that's interesting is the the way most of these CGMs work is they are they're actually measuring what's called interstitial fluid, which is uh, the fluid between your cells, but it's not in your like bloodstream. Um, so there's actually a, a time shift. Um, the the way that the uh, glucose. Oh, I think we we're lost still them. here. Sorry, my camera just died. Oh, there. But we're still, we're no still here. <laughs> Um, no, just, just to finish out quickly, there, there's actually a time difference between the, the blood levels and the interstitial fluid glucose levels and the CGMs try to approximate. They like try to, um, guess at, at where your, your blood levels are based on your interstitial fluid, but you may see that there's like a 15 minute difference. So what I've noticed consistently is when I am kind of crashing, I'll, uh, before it shows up on my CGM, I'll feel the sensation. And then by the time I'm like kind of out of that, I don't feel that feeling anymore. My glucose is showing a dip. And so there's like a little bit of a time shift. And once you start to notice that you'll see like, Oh yeah, 15 minutes ago, I was feeling like really crappy and now it's showing up Mm -hmm. on the data. So it's one of the little things that will eventually be worked out with software. Yeah. That happens to me all the time. (laughs) (laughs) I'll literally be like, why do I feel so dizzy and weak? And I can barely see straight. My (laughs) blood sugar is 85 and then I'll finger prick just to make sure. And it's like, Oh, you're really 45. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny that that like slight delay, I think mm-hmm. is part, like part of, we get a lot of users saying that one of the things they love about this is that it helps you build your intuition about your body. So yeah. like it's, yeah, it just sort of gets rid of some of that mystery. And so that delay is almost like a hypothesis testing. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, Oh, I feel this way. And then let's see what happens in 10, 15 minutes. And I think as you build that feedback loop a little bit, it, it just, you know, I think you just, gain a little bit more trust in your body. Like, okay, mm-hmm. what I'm feeling is real and I can trust these sensations. And, um, yeah, it's just like a little, a little verification tool, um, for what you're feeling, which is kind of cool. Exactly. So for people who are interested, how can they find you and how can they get more information about you guys? Yeah. Um, so the website is levelshealth.com. Um, I personally recommend levelshealth.com forward slash blog. And that's where we publish, uh, all of the research and a lot of the insights that uh, CGM is uh, teaching us, teaching society and, and the implications for the technology. And uh, in terms of how the, we can, we can uh, or when rather the, the levels program will be available, we are still in the development state. So the, we're, we're actively working on our, uh, the levels analytics platform, which is layering on to CGM hardware and producing insights and actionable data from this like data stream. Um, that process is going to continue this year. We're going to have a, a full public launch uh, some 
sometime later this year, the schedule is sort of TBD as, as is everything in, in today's world. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but certainly if you go to the website, you can go to levelshealth.com forward slash sign up or just click the button on the homepage and add your email, add a little info about yourself. And uh, you can stay in the loop as we do uh, produce more details about our full launch. Um, we have a beta uh, program that's going on right now. It's our, like our early access program. And it's basically an opportunity to t- partake in the development process. So to be one of the earliest testers of the Levels program and to help us fine tune the development, right? So understanding how this feature should develop and taking recommendations from real people who, who really are learning from this in real time. And so we, we have a few slots per month uh, for our beta program. We're, we're a little bit picky about uh who, who gets those spots because we want to make sure that we can maximize the feedback loop with, uh, with the team. So there, there's a possibility if you sign up, we can maybe uh, get you into a beta slot, but um, certainly this year we will be uh, more widely available and um, yeah, stay, stay tuned. Awesome. Oh yeah. And sorry, you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Those are both at unlock levels. All right, cool. <laughs> Sweet. Got to put that one in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you again for listening to today's episode of the Work for Change podcast. Um, I think it has a lot of great information and I'm really excited for you guys to listen. Please let us know what you guys think about it, um, either by giving us a rating in the iTunes store or by going over to our Instagram or YouTube page and leaving a comment. Um, We love hearing from you guys. You can find out more about Unlock Levels by going to their website, their Instagram, their Twitter, all Unlock Levels. And I'm really excited to keep you guys updated on um, how this works as an experiment. It's just one big experiment to solve world hanger. And I'm excited to be a part of that. Have a great week, guys. See you next week.